I was in a remote area of Oregon, spending several days trekking through the national parks. I was already about 15 miles away from the nearest road, and for the first two days, I hadn't encountered a single person. It was the start of autumn, so the weather was a bit chillier than most would prefer, but I was well prepared with all the necessary gear. One morning, I woke up, brewed some coffee on my portable stove, and then set off toward the next campsite. It was about eight miles away, which is quite a long hike in the mountains. About four hours into the walk, I suddenly heard footsteps ahead of me. I looked up and saw a man walking along the trail, coming toward me. I wasn't expecting to see anyone, but I smiled and nodded as he passed by. However, something struck me as odd. He wasn't carrying a backpack, water, or anything else. He was just wearing a long-sleeved shirt and old hiking pants. I even turned around to get another look at him out of confusion. But when I did, he glanced back at me too. Not wanting to seem weird, I just turned back around and continued walking. After gaining some distance, I put the encounter out of my mind. I convinced myself he probably had a campsite nearby and was just out for a walk, even though I knew there were no established campsites nearby. Whatever the case, I didn't dwell on it too much. The next several hours were tough, but I eventually made it to my campsite. It was completely empty, with just one small spot to pitch my tent. It wasn't as picturesque as I'd hoped. The view was supposed to be amazing, but from the actual campsite, there wasn't much to see because of all the trees. The whole place felt more like being in the middle of a forest than on a mountaintop. I was exhausted though, so I quickly set up my tent and relaxed while watching the sunset. As I sat there, I suddenly heard a rustling sound behind me. I turned around and was shocked to see the same man I had encountered earlier. He still had no backpack or supplies, but what was even more baffling was why he was at this campsite. He had been walking in the opposite direction when I saw him earlier, so he must have turned around shortly after passing me. As he approached the campsite, he didn't acknowledge me, almost as if he was purposely pretending I wasn't there or couldn't see me. He went to the other side of the small clearing and sat down, no tent, no sleeping bag, nothing, just sitting on the ground and staring into the forest. He was only about 15 feet away from me, but since he was looking away, I was able to get a better look at him. The man seemed to be in his late 30s, with a short, scruffy beard and short brown hair. I couldn't shake the uneasy feeling that something was very wrong. As the sun continued to set, the feeling of being unsafe only grew stronger. Who was this guy, and why was he 20 miles out in the woods with no shelter, food, or water? After about 30 minutes, he still hadn't moved. I decided that I couldn't stay there. I had no other place to go, but I figured I needed to find a random spot to camp where he couldn't follow me. I began taking down my tent and packing up, and it was only then that the man looked over at me. Once he did, he never looked away, staring at me intently. Every time I glanced over, he was still watching me. After everything was packed up, I saw from the corner of my eye that he stood up. I started walking as fast as I could, hearing his footsteps close behind me. I held onto my small knife tightly, unsure of what was going to happen. After a minute, I looked back a few times, seeing him still following but gradually falling behind. I took a risk and veered off the trail into the woods. It was pitch black by then, so I hoped he didn't see me and would just keep walking. Once I was about 30 feet into the woods, I hid behind a tree and waited. About 30 seconds later, his footsteps came down the trail. Just as he was about to pass by, he stopped, looking around as if he knew I wasn't on the trail anymore. Then he started yelling, trying to sound friendly, which only made it more disturbing. After two minutes of this, he stopped yelling, but instead of returning to the campsite, he walked straight into the woods on the opposite side of the trail. His figure vanished into the trees, and everything went silent. I stayed there for over an hour before finally getting up and making my way back. I forced myself to keep going, skipping the next campsite just to be safe. When I finally got back to town, 
I reported the incident to the local police. They never followed up with me. I don't know if that man was living out there trying to rob or kidnap people or something else entirely, but I'm grateful I got away when I did. This happened a little over two years ago. My name is Mike, and before this, I had absolutely no experience with camping. I was eager to give it a try, and I knew the only way to learn was to just dive in. So, this was my first camping trip. I chose a campground about two hours away from my hometown. It seemed like a place that wouldn't be overly crowded but also not completely deserted, which I thought would be perfect for a beginner like me. I drove up and arrived at the trailhead around midday, then hiked for a few more hours until I reached the campsite. There were a few park benches and some fixed barbecue grills scattered around. A few short trails branched off to smaller campsites where other people had already set up their tents. I picked one of these trails, put down my gear, and spent the next hour setting up my tent, making sure everything was in working order. By then, some people had gathered in the main area, using the grills and chatting. I'm not particularly outgoing, so I didn't feel comfortable joining them uninvited. However, about half an hour later, a guy came over to where I was set up and invited me to hang out with them. It was a kind gesture and he seemed friendly enough so I decided to join them. I followed him back to the main area and met a few others who were camping there. Everyone seemed nice, so I stayed for another hour or so. After a while, people started heading off and I said goodnight and went back to my tent. It was probably around 7 p.m., so there was only about an hour of daylight left. Not long after, the same guy, his name was Tim, came back to my tent. For context, he was about my age, mid to late twenties. When he approached, he asked if I had ever been to this area before. I said no. Then he asked if I knew about a nearby lake. Again, I said no and he immediately started telling me about this amazing hidden lake that almost no one knew about. He mentioned how it was a really cool spot and suggested we check it out together. It seemed like a friendly offer, and I was genuinely curious, so I quickly tossed my things back into my tent and followed him. He said it was about a 10-minute walk through the woods, so we had plenty of time before sunset. We followed a narrow path through the trees. It wasn't a well-defined trail, but it looked like it had been used a few times before. 10 minutes passed, but there was still no lake in sight. Tim, who had been very talkative and charismatic earlier, suddenly became quiet, offering only one word answers. He also kept glancing at the sunset. While it could have been that he was just checking the time, something in me felt like he was waiting for the sun to go down. After about 20 minutes of walking, I started to distance myself from him. I wasn't sure what was going on, but I could feel my adrenaline kicking in. The sun was barely illuminating the thin rows of trees, and suddenly, the forest felt eerily quiet. When I saw an opportunity, I quietly turned and tried to run back the way we came. He immediately noticed. At first, he called out to me in a friendly tone but that quickly changed to frustrated yelling as I heard him sprinting after me. There was probably a minute or so of him shouting and chasing me through the woods before I heard his footsteps slow down. Then, I heard a loud metallic sound right behind me. I glanced back briefly and saw what looked like a knife bouncing off a tree just a few feet from me. It seemed like a last-ditch effort to stop me. Thankfully, I managed to lose him. I made it back to the others at the campsite and tried to explain what had happened. One of them called the police for me. Tim, or whatever his real name was, never returned. In fact, everyone said he had already been at the campsite when they arrived, and after some checking, it turned out he didn't even have a tent. He likely targeted me because I was alone and inexperienced with hiking or camping. I'm just glad I didn't have to find out what he had planned for that night because if I had, I probably wouldn't be here today.
Last year, I spent a couple of weeks in Montana, living out of a camper attached to the back of my truck. I usually stayed at campgrounds or on public land wherever I could find a spot. As my trip was winding down, I needed to start heading back the way I came. Unfortunately, my truck ran into some issues that day, and it took most of the day to fix. By the time the sun was setting, I had barely made any progress on my journey. I grabbed a coffee from a gas station and decided to drive for at least two more hours before finding a place to camp for the night. The road cleared up and I found myself mostly alone. Using an app, I located the nearest spot where I could camp, which was just off the road on public land. The turn led to a narrow dirt path that went about a quarter mile into the woods, ending in a small grassy circle surrounded by trees. No other campers were around. I parked at the edge of the circle, facing the exit, and then went around to the camper to settle in. It was probably around 11 or 12 at night, and I was ready to fall asleep as soon as I lay down. But just a minute later, a beam of light shone through the edges of the privacy screen on my windows. I sat up and lifted the corner just enough to peek outside. Another vehicle's headlights were approaching down the path. As they got closer and reached the end of the path, they slowed down and came to a stop. It seemed like they saw me and didn't want to camp at the same spot. But instead of turning around, they just stayed there, blocking the only way out. I could tell it was a truck, old and rusty, but the headlights were too bright to make out much else. Something felt off. It was just a gut feeling, but after a few minutes of them sitting there, I knew I wasn't going to be able to sleep. I folded up my bed and got up, but before I could leave the camper and get into my truck, I heard one of their doors open. I peeked out the window again. They had turned off their headlights, and two men were standing outside in the dark, walking towards my camper. I could only make out the outline of something in their hands. I covered the window and listened as their footsteps got closer. They were trying to be quiet, carefully moving around my truck until they suddenly stopped. It was like they somehow knew I was awake. One of them spoke, Hey, can you help us? We just need some directions. Can you open up? Their voices were slurred, and I could tell they were either drunk or up to no good. I sneaked another look out the window and saw one of them right up against my truck, holding what looked like a crowbar or something similar. That confirmed their bad intentions. I was trapped in my camper, with no way to get to my truck without going outside. One of them walked up to the door, scraping something against it and pressing into it, trying to force it open. I don't know why, but I kept trying to be quiet as if they didn't know I was inside. I put my legs against the door, holding it in place, when suddenly, there was a gunshot. It didn't come from the men, though. It came from somewhere out in the woods. Both men froze for a moment, then sprinted back to their truck and drove off within 30 seconds. I still have no idea who fired that shot, but I knew it was my best chance to get out of there. I fled from the camper and jumped into my truck, starting it up and speeding down the path to the main road. I drove for about an hour before stopping at a relatively busy truck stop. What really happened back there is still a mystery to me. My best guess is that a hunter or someone camping nearby saw what was happening and fired a warning shot to scare them off. Considering how remote I was, it's hard to believe but it's the only explanation that makes sense. If it weren't for that shot, my truck and camper might be listed on Craigslist right now, and I might never have been seen again. There's not much to do in my small town. Without the internet, I would have been stuck spending time at the local cafe desperate to occupy myself. Even with unlimited entertainment and information at my disposal, I still can't find answers about what happened last summer. I'm more of an indoor person, but somehow my friend Benny convinced me to join him on a camping trip with his brother and another childhood friend. We all grew up together, but Benny's brother, who was two years older, and I never really connected. I didn't dislike him, 
We just didn't have much in common. My best friend, the most beautiful girl in town, knew how pretty she was. I had been in love with her since we were 13 but never told her. I feared that admitting my feelings would change our relationship, and I didn't want to risk losing our friendship. The only reason I agreed to go camping was that Lisa was coming along. I think Benny and Greg knew this, so they told me she was joining us when I initially refused. It was a hot day, and we were all sweating by the time we reached the campsite. Can we set up the tents later? Benny asked as he dropped his bags. No, let's do it now or we'll never get to it. I insisted. I knew from their last trip that they were too lazy to set up tents and ended up sleeping outside in their sleeping bags, covered in bug bites. I didn't want to experience that, so they reluctantly agreed. Lisa and I worked on one tent while the brothers set up the other. There's only two tents, I pointed out. We've shared tents before, she replied without looking up. If she had looked, she would have seen how red my face had become. At least I could blame the hot weather for my flushed cheeks. Benny decided to throw a full water bottle at Greg, but it missed and hit me on the back of my head, prompting me to go over and roughhouse with them for a bit. Lisa crossed her arms, amused by us. As I got back up from our playful fight, I noticed something white flash between the trees. I was about to mention it, but it disappeared as quickly as it appeared. We had chosen a campsite that wasn't popular with the locals, but that didn't mean no one else was in the woods. Once the campsite was set up, we put away the food to prevent animals from getting to it, gathered firewood, and then headed down the path to the lake. We all deserved a long swim after the work we'd done. Benny and Greg walked ahead, and I helped Lisa down the rough path. Should we really be camping right now? Lisa asked loudly enough for Benny to hear. Wasn't there a big search here recently? I heard about that. Benny chimed in, explaining how for campers, high on something, wandered into the woods and vanished. That was three weeks ago, so I doubt we'll run into a crazed camper, he added with a shrug. It was a bit heartless, but he was right. After three weeks in the summer heat, those people didn't have much chance of surviving. Just in case, let's not go into the woods alone tonight, I suggested, feeling a sudden chill despite the heat. Is that your thing, watching people pee? Benny teased. I think he prefers number two, Greg added. Weird how quickly you two thought of that. Almost like it was on your mind, I replied. I'd been dealing with these guys for years and was used to their dumb jokes. Lisa giggled at us, and I wondered why she put up with three idiots like us. The lake water wasn't as cool as I hoped. It helped with the heat, but I almost wished I were home with the AC blasting, until I saw Lisa in her black swimsuit. The thought of AC quickly disappeared from my mind. I tried to keep my eyes off her so she wouldn't realize what a creep I was. Hey, do you see that? I asked Benny as he swam over to me. He playfully wrapped an arm around my neck to drag me under but stopped when I spoke. He followed my gaze toward the woods, trying to spot what I was staring at. Is that a person? He asked, squinting. Soon, Greg and Lisa were looking in the same direction. A white shape was visible between two trees on the other side of the lake. It looked like a person, but it was impossible to tell from that distance. It was too still to be a person, yet it didn't sway in the breeze like a discarded shirt or trash would. Let's go check it out, Benny said, letting go of my neck and starting to swim away. Lisa swam up next to me. What do you think it is? She asked. When I took my eyes off the trees to look at her, the white object disappeared. Benny stopped swimming when he realized what we had been watching was gone. Probably some old pervert watching a pretty little thing like you swim, Benny said with a splash. He's implying the pervert is watching you, Greg finished with a grin. I splashed water in his face, and soon the white shape was forgotten as we started a water fight. I kept glancing back at the trees, but the white shape didn't return, and I assumed it was nothing. We headed back to the campsite as the sky turned orange. 
Benny and Greg chanted the whole way about the beans they were going to cook. I was glad I wasn't sharing a tent with them tonight. When we got back, they realized they had left the bag with the beans in the truck, and Lisa had also forgotten a few things, so she wanted to go back with them. I didn't feel like walking, so I volunteered to stay behind and start the fire. They had been gone for about five minutes when I heard Benny's voice again, oddly coming from the direction of the lake instead of the path they took. Did you forget something? I called out. His voice came again, but I couldn't make out the words. It was strange because he would have had to walk through the campsite to get back to the lake. I stood up, straining to listen. Benny, stop messing around. I shouted, my voice echoing through the trees. Had he taken a long way around just to scare me? No, he hadn't been gone long enough to be that far out. I took another step closer but stopped. Something felt off. After those campers got lost in these woods, I decided I didn't want to venture down the path alone. I went back to setting up the fire and getting dinner ready, thinking that if Benny was playing a prank, he would get bored and come back. Oddly enough, all three of my friends returned together. Did you see any other cars around? I asked, wondering if there was another camper nearby who sounded like Benny. No, it's just us. Why? Lisa asked, noticing something was bothering me. I heard something while you were gone. It sounded human, but it's hard to say now. I replied, starting to doubt myself. Probably a bird. Some of those loons sound creepy, Greg said with a shrug. He camped here often, so I figured he knew what he was talking about and dismissed my concerns. We settled down to eat. The brothers happily devoured their beans while Lisa and I stuck to hot dogs. After dinner, the brothers lit up a joint. I didn't smoke, but Lisa occasionally did. However, she passed that night, probably not wanting to bring the smell into the shared tent. Benny stood up, saying he needed to use the bathroom so I handed him a flashlight. I also needed to go, and Greg decided to join us. Lisa didn't want to be left alone, so we all went for a bathroom break together. It was hard to focus with Lisa so close by, even though she had her back turned to us. It took me the longest to finish. We found a good spot for her, gave her some privacy, and kept an eye out for any wild animals. With that taken care of, we were about to head back when we heard an unnatural sound. A baby crying, just a few feet away. I saw Benny's pale face in the flashlight beam. Greg silently shook his head as Lisa stood frozen in place. I took a step closer to the sound, but Greg grabbed my shoulder. No way, he whispered. I agreed and stepped back. We should leave, I suggested. But Lisa, bless her heart, didn't want to risk someone being in trouble. She bravely marched into the woods, with the three of us following, whispering for her to stop. We found the source of the sound. A person sitting on a log in a small clearing, dressed in rags with their back to us, rocking back and forth while making shushing sounds. The baby's cries had stopped. This was terrifying, like something out of a nightmare. Are you okay? Lisa asked in a shaky voice. My baby, my poor baby, the woman replied, sounding so normal compared to how she looked. We can call someone for help, Lisa offered. My poor baby is starving, the figure said, slowly turning her head. The light caught her gray eyes, reflecting in our flashlights. Stringy gray hair fell over her pale face. At first, her expression was blank, then it twisted into something monstrous. Benny and Greg screamed and ran, leaving Lisa and me behind. I grabbed her wrist and pulled her along as the pale creature screeched and started to chase us on all fours. It leaped into the air, its mouth open and bony claws outstretched. I yanked Lisa out of the way just in time, and the creature crashed into the tree, its body twisting and flailing as it tried to right itself. I pulled Lisa by the arm, dragging her through the underbrush. Her breathing was ragged, and she stumbled, but I kept her moving, my heart pounding in my chest. The creature let out an ear-splitting screech and charged after us. 
I glanced back and saw it gaining ground, its white form blending with the shadows of the forest. I tightened my grip on Lisa and we pushed ourselves harder, desperate to escape. As we sprinted through the forest, the branches whipped at our faces, and the eerie whistling sound from earlier seemed to grow louder. I could see the light of the campfire in the distance and aimed for it, hoping that reaching the campsite would provide some safety. We reached the edge of the clearing, and I could hear Benny and Darren shouting in panic. Their voices were a mix of fear and urgency. I spotted them near the campsite, their expressions mirroring our terror. I pushed Lisa toward them and shouted, We need to get out of here now. Darren grabbed Lisa and pulled her toward the campfire, his face pale but determined. Benny was already on the phone, his hands trembling as he tried to get help. I glanced back into the woods, expecting to see the creature emerging again. Instead, all was silent, save for the crackling of the fire and the distant cries of unseen animals. The creature seemed to have vanished, but I knew better than to think it was gone for good. As we gathered around the fire, I realized how close we had come to disaster. Lisa was shaking, and I tried to comfort her, though my own hands were unsteady. It's going to be okay, I said, though I wasn't entirely sure myself. Benny's phone call was finally answered, and he explained the situation to the authorities. As we waited for help, the reality of what had happened began to sink in. The woods were not safe, and the night had turned into a nightmare that none of us would soon forget. When the rescue team arrived, they quickly assessed the situation and led us back through the forest. The creature had not reappeared, and we were guided to safety, but the scars of the night lingered with each step we took. The forest, once a place of adventure and camaraderie, had become a dark and dangerous realm. I knew that our lives would never be the same, and the terror we faced would forever be etched in our memories. It was 3.30 a.m., pitch dark and far too early for anyone to be up. But there I was lying in bed, staring at the ceiling of my barracks room at Camp Lejeune, North Carolina. My alarm had just blared a piercing sound that seemed much louder in the silence of the early morning. Today wasn't just any day. It was the beginning of a two-week field training exercise, what we in the military referred to as the field. Honestly, I was among the few who didn't dread it. Sure, we'd be cut off from cell phones, signal bars, and worst of all, showers. But it was an opportunity to escape the routine of daily duties and spend some time outdoors, even if it was in a dense wooded training area. Dragging myself out of bed, I managed to get ready in record time. Last warm shower for two weeks? Check. A decent breakfast that didn't come from a mess hall? Double check. Living in the barracks had its perks sometimes, and being a short walk from where we had to assemble was definitely one of them. When I arrived at the company area, a bunch of my fellow soldiers were already there, looking as thrilled as kids on their way to the dentist. Some were practically asleep on their feet, others were chugging energy drinks like water. I felt like an old man among them, even though I was only in my mid-twenties. Most of these guys weren't even old enough to legally drink, but that never stopped them. We lined up to collect our gear and weapons for the training. I felt a pang of sympathy for those stuck carrying the M249S. Those things were beasts, but soon enough we were all kicked out and ready to go. Our platoon leader gave us a brief rundown of what to expect. Follow the vehicle ahead, watch for potential IEDs, and ensure we cover our sectors of fire. It was nothing I hadn't heard before. With a bit of luck, I ended up driving the lead Humvee with our platoon leader riding shotgun issuing orders like he was born to do it. The drive to the training site took about an hour, and we arrived at a remote wooded area far from the base, our home for the next two weeks. Setting up camp took several hours, but by the time we finished, it felt like we had accomplished something. 
Tents were pitched, a fire watch roster was set up, and I drew the short straw for the 3 a.m. guard shift, just my luck. Standing guard in the dead of night, I tried out the night vision goggles, NVGs, handed to me by the previous watch. The woods came alive under the green glow of the NVGs, and for a moment, I felt a sense of peace until I caught two privates sneaking off for a not-so-secret rendezvous. I chose to give them some privacy. After all, we were all adults here, but that sense of peace didn't last. As my shift dragged on and I fought to stay awake, something caught my eye. A figure stood at the tree line, just watching. It was too far to make out any details, but the way it seemed to stare right back gave me the creeps. My wristwatch alarm went off suddenly, nearly giving me a heart attack, and just like that, the figure was gone. I tried to brush it off as my imagination running wild, but a part of me couldn't shake the feeling of being watched. Reluctantly, I finished my shift and woke the next guard, then curled up in the back of my Humvee. Whatever it was, I didn't want to see it again. But as I drifted off to sleep, I couldn't help but wonder what lurked in the shadows of those woods. The next day, after what felt like only minutes of sleep, the sun was already peeking through the trees, announcing the start of a new day. With the previous night's creepy encounter still fresh in my mind, I pushed it aside, convincing myself it was just the result of too little sleep and an overactive imagination. Today was about land navigation, something I was actually looking forward to. No lieutenants messing with maps meant we might actually stand a chance of finding our waypoints without getting hopelessly lost. Breakfast was quick, and then we were grouped into threes, handed our coordinates, and sent off into the woods. The dense canopy above us turned the morning light into a sort of perpetual twilight, and the untouched nature of the terrain made every step feel like stepping into the unknown. We were on the lookout for venomous snakes as much as we were for our next waypoint. The first few coordinates led us deeper into the forest, and each time we found our mark, it felt like a small victory. But when we reached a coordinate that led us to a lone cone in the middle of nowhere with a photo of a young soldier taped to it, things started to feel off. Who was this soldier and why was his picture out here? It was a question none of us could answer, but I took a picture of it with my phone anyway, thinking it might make sense later. As the day wore on and shadows grew longer, we realized we needed to head back before darkness made the woods an even more confusing labyrinth. I remember joking about not wanting to spend the night out there, but the humor was lost on me the moment Kion, one of my group members, mentioned he thought we were being followed. Stopping in our tracks, we listened. There was a distinct sound of someone or something moving through the underbrush behind us. But when we stopped, it stopped too. That's when the real fear set in. Was it just some drill sergeant playing mind games? Or was it something else? We decided against running. It could provoke whatever was out there if it turned out to be more than just a human prankster. Pushing forward, every rustle of leaves had us on edge. I kept thinking about those horror movies where you scream at the characters to do the smart thing. Now I was in one of those movies, and there didn't seem to be any smart option available. When we were about a mile from camp, that's when it decided to make its move. Something darted across our path so fast I barely caught a glimpse, but it was enough to see its eyes reflecting in the flashlight, enough to see it wasn't human. The forest around us erupted into chaos as we saw more of them, eyes glowing, watching us from the darkness. Diaz, another member of our trio, pointed his flashlight at a tree, revealing one of those things clinging to it, smiling that grotesque smile. That's when panic took over. The sound of a gunshot ripped through the air as we turned and ran, not caring about the noise or direction, only wanting to get away. I don't remember much about the run back. My lungs burned, my gear felt like it weighed a ton, and the forest seemed to close in around us. We were no longer soldiers in training, we were prey running for our lives. I fired my weapon into the darkness, knowing it was useless hearing screams that I couldn't place as human or otherwise. Somehow, I made it back to camp alone and out of breath, with no sign of Diaz or Kion. 
What happened out there? I couldn't fully explain, but the looks on the faces of my fellow soldiers as they saw me covered in blood and rambling about creatures in the woods told me everything I needed to know. They thought I had lost my mind and maybe I had, but not in the way they believed. Waking up in camp, the morning light did little to ease the horror of the previous night. I was covered in blood, my heart was racing, and Diaz and Kion were nowhere to be found. The camp was in chaos, with soldiers looking at me like I was a ghost or worse, a monster. I tried to explain, to tell them about the creatures in the woods, but the words wouldn't come out right. It was like trying to describe a nightmare while still dreaming it. Before I could even attempt to make sense, I was grabbed, questioned, and then quickly restrained. My platoon leader looked at me with eyes full of anger and fear. His questions were sharp, demanding to know what had happened to Diaz and Kion. I tried to tell him, tried to warn him about the creatures, but it only made things worse. The disbelief in his eyes turned to rage and then to violence. I was left alone, tied up, wondering if I was the only one who knew the truth and if that truth would even matter. Time passed slowly in that makeshift prison. My thoughts were a jumbled mess of fear, confusion, and an overwhelming sense of dread. They sent another search party out despite my warnings. I knew it was a mistake, but there was nothing I could do. When the platoon leader finally came back, the look on his face said it all. The static from the radio, the absence of any response, the distant gunfire, it was happening again, and this time they couldn't deny it. They cut me loose, but it wasn't out of trust or understanding. It was out of necessity. The camp was under attack, and every able body was needed. I grabbed a pair of night vision goggles and looked out into the night. There they were, the creatures attacking my friends, my comrades. It was a scene straight out of a horror movie, only this was real and the fear was paralyzing. I crawled to a Humvee, desperate to escape, to survive. The engine roared to life and for a moment I thought I might make it. But then, tapping on the window, one of those things was smiling at me, its mouth stained with blood. In that horrifying moment, I knew there was no time to hesitate. I slammed my foot on the gas, sending the Humvee careening over branches and rocks in my desperate bid to escape. The engine roared, and the vehicle jolted violently as I sped through the woods, driven by a primal instinct to survive. The forest around me was a blur of darkness and chaos. The creatures were everywhere, their eerie eyes reflecting in my headlights as they pursued me. My heart pounded in my chest, each beat a reminder of how close I was to being caught. The terror was overwhelming, a physical weight pressing down on me as I fought to keep the Humvee moving. By some miracle, I reached the edge of the forest and saw the distant lights of the base. Relief surged through me, but it was short-lived. As I barreled toward the base, I could see the camp was already in disarray. Soldiers were scrambling, shouting, and firing their weapons into the darkness. The creatures had breached the perimeter. I skidded to a halt, leaping from the Humvee and rushing toward the nearest command tent. My fellow soldiers, stunned and disoriented, looked at me with a mix of fear and disbelief. I tried to shout over the din, explaining what I had seen, but my words were swallowed by the cacophony of chaos. In the midst of the confusion, I was seized by a group of soldiers and forcibly restrained. My frantic explanations were drowned out by their orders, and I was shoved into a makeshift holding area. The night was a whirlwind of noise and terror as the base fought off the onslaught. Hours later, as the first light of dawn began to break, the attack finally subsided. The camp was left in ruins, and the survivors were left to deal with the aftermath. My recounting of the events was met with a mixture of skepticism and horror. The creatures I had described were dismissed as hallucinations or stress-induced delusions. Despite my pleas, I was held under guard while a search party was sent out to investigate. They returned with little to show for their efforts, 
and my claims were dismissed as the ravings of a traumatized mind. The truth of what happened that night was buried under layers of denial and disbelief. Eventually, I was released but medically discharged from the military. I was given a pension and sent away from the base. I left Fort Bragg, but the nightmares followed me. The eyes in the darkness and the tapping on the window haunted my dreams. I tried to start over, moving to a quiet town far from the military and the woods that had become a part of my personal nightmare. Yet, no matter how far I moved, the memories lingered. Some nights, I would awaken in a cold sweat, convinced that the creatures were still out there, watching me, waiting for the next chance to strike. The terror of that night had changed me. I was left with the unsettling knowledge that some things are better left unexplored, hidden away in the shadows of the woods. And though I hoped the nightmare was over, deep down, I knew that the horrors of that night were far from finished. I've always felt a connection with the untamed landscapes that stretch far beyond our usual lives. There's something about the raw, unfiltered beauty of nature that speaks to me in a way that nothing else does. This bond is something I share with my partner. It's an invisible thread that pulls us into the wilderness time and again. On a foggy Friday, with the weekend stretching ahead of us and free from plans, she suggested a camping trip. The idea struck a chord with me, resonating with my deep-seated need to escape our mundane existence. We decided on a forest a few hours' drive from our place, a spot we hadn't explored before but had heard was a hiker's paradise. Without a car, we set off on foot. Our journey took us through landscapes that changed from the familiar to the increasingly remote. The trek, lasting between two and a half to three hours, tested our resolve but also strengthened our bond, not just with each other but with the world around us. As we entered the forest, the sun dipped low, painting the sky in hues of fire and gold. The scene was breathtaking, a perfect welcome to what promised to be a retreat from the chaos of our daily lives. We hiked, lost in the tranquility of our surroundings, our conversation flowing as smoothly as the wind through the trees. But then a ripple of unease appeared. My partner, more attuned to the nuances of our environment than I, mentioned seeing something. A presence, she said, watching from the shadows between the trees. I tried to see what she saw, peering into the dense underbrush, but found nothing. I chalked it up to her imagination and anxiety. Her steps drew closer to mine as she sought reassurance. I wrapped an arm around her, and for a moment, the unease faded, swallowed by the forest's serene embrace. We stumbled upon a clearing seemingly designed for us, a secluded haven in the heart of the woods. Fallen trees lay in a rough square, inviting us to set up camp. This was our spot, our temporary home away from home, surrounded by nature's unspoiled beauty. We pitched our tent with practiced ease, turning the clearing into a cozy retreat. As twilight deepened into night, we lit a fire. Its warm glow was a beacon against the encroaching darkness. We cooked, ate, and talked, our conversation meandering through various topics. Our voices mingled with the crackle of the fire and the whisper of the wind through the trees. It was late when we decided to turn in. The night wrapped the forest in a blanket of stars, and our sleeping bags promised comfort against the chill. Our tent was a shield against the wild. As I drifted off to sleep, I felt a profound sense of peace, a belief that all was right in the world. Little did I know, the darkness held secrets, and our sanctuary was not as safe as we thought. The night was alive, breathing and whispering around our tent, a cocoon in the heart of the wilderness. In those quiet hours, with the fire reduced to embers and the forest a shadowy realm beyond our canvas walls, reality began to shift. It started with a simple act so mundane it would have been forgettable in any other context. My partner, 
Her voice tinged with an emotion I couldn't quite place, whispered that she needed a bathroom break. There was a rare fragility in her tone. My concern spiked, manifesting as a knot in my gut. Are you all right? I asked, trying to mask my sudden anxiety. Yeah, I'm fine, she replied, though her voice betrayed her. She left the tent, her silhouette against the faint glow of our dying fire. As the zipper closed behind her, a chill ran down my spine, an instinctual warning that something was amiss. Minutes stretched into what felt like eternity. The nocturnal chorus of the forest played on, indifferent to my growing unease. Fifteen minutes passed, then twenty. It was too long for her to be gone. I called out, my voice swallowed by the vastness of the night, receiving no response but the rustling of leaves and the distant call of a night bird. Panic propelled me out of the tent, flashlight in hand. I scanned the darkness, the beam of light a feeble attempt to pierce the overwhelming black. A faint whimper guided me deeper into the woods, away from the safety of our camp. And then I saw her. The flashlight fell from my hand, its light landing on a scene so horrific that my mind struggled to comprehend it. She was suspended from a tree, her body a testament to unspeakable violence. Half of her face was gone, torn away by something my mind reeled to understand. Her last words were a whisper, a plea laced with love and a warning I couldn't fully grasp. Stay away from the cave. Then she was gone, her body going limp, leaving me alone in the night with my grief and growing terror. The mention of the cave sparked a curiosity, a need to understand and find the source of this nightmare. My heart pounded as I approached the dark maw in the earth. What I found was a creature from a nightmare, grotesque and otherworldly, making my mind struggle to accept its reality. It spoke, its voice a mockery of human speech, taunting me with my ignorance, my failure to protect her, and to believe her fears. I couldn't stay, couldn't bear the weight of its gaze or the truth in its words. I fled, stumbling through the dark, the forest now a labyrinth of shadows and fear. Behind me, the creature laughed, a sound that would haunt me for the rest of my days. The escape was a blur of terror and adrenaline. The forest felt hostile, intent on my demise. I emerged broken and alone, back into a world that now seemed alien. I had survived, but at what cost? The night had shattered the illusion of safety and sanity, leaving me with a shattered reality. Dawn broke with cruel clarity, its light a stark contrast to the darkness that had consumed my world. The forest, once a place of refuge and beauty, now felt like a prison, its trees silent witnesses to the night's horror. My escape, driven by primal fear and the instinct to survive, was a frenzied dash through the underbrush. Every shadow felt like a threat, every sound a potential harbinger of death. The creature's taunts echoed in my mind, a constant reminder of my failure and the price of disbelief. I'll find you someday, it had shouted, its voice a chilling promise of endless fear. You can join that foolish woman of yours in the futile void we call death. The words were poison seeping into my soul, leaving me with a terror that would never fully dissipate. Somehow, I made it to the road, my body moving on autopilot, driven by a deep-seated need to return to normalcy, a world where such monsters couldn't possibly exist. I hitchhiked back to civilization, my story pouring out in a disjointed flood to the stranger who picked me up. To my surprise, there was no skepticism in his eyes, only a deep, unsettling understanding. Back in the realm of the living, the reality of what had happened hit me like a physical blow. I was truly alone in a way I had never been before. My partner, my love, my companion in every adventure, was gone taken by a horror that defied explanation. I told my story repeatedly, to the police, to friends, to anyone who would listen. Reactions varied from disbelief to horror, but a surprising number of people believed me. 
It turned out there were legends about the forest, tales of a creature lurking in the shadows, preying on the unsuspecting. These stories, once mere tales, now felt like grim warnings ignored at our peril. The days turned into weeks, then months, but the terror of that night remained a constant shadow. Sleep was elusive. Each night was a battle against the memories that surged forth the moment I closed my eyes. Sometimes, in the darkest hours before dawn, I would see it. The outline of a hunched, grotesque figure lurking in the corners of my room, drawing closer with each passing night. The guilt was a relentless companion, gnawing at me with the persistence of a predator. I could have prevented it all, could have saved her if only I had believed and listened. That realization was a weight I would carry for the rest of my days. The forest, once a place of escape and joy, now represented something else entirely. A reminder of the fragility of life and the thin veneer of safety separating us from the darkness. I had sought solace in the wild, only to find a nightmare that would forever haunt my dreams. As I moved through life, a shell of my former self, I couldn't shake the feeling that the creature's eyes were still on me, watching, waiting. The wilderness had called, and we had answered, not knowing that some calls are better left unanswered. The wild had revealed its true nature, unforgiving and unpredictable, a reminder that despite all our advancements, we are still at the mercy of forces beyond our understanding and control. I shouted to my brother, I'm not afraid of anything. As I slammed my car door shut, my voice echoing down the street, I remember his smirk as he held out my jacket like a surrender flag, listing all the things I should fear, skinwalkers, witches, werewolves, like characters straight out of a horror film. He seemed to think he could frighten me into backing down. I rolled my eyes, grabbed my jacket, and shouted back, I'm not afraid before driving away. The jagged peaks of the mountains ahead, silhouetted against the setting sun, looked like giant teeth ready to devour me. I wish I'd heeded his warnings. It all started a few days prior. Depression had become my constant companion, following me everywhere and whispering thoughts of jumping off bridges or stepping into traffic. I was exhausted from battling it. One of my friends, probably fed up with my dark mood, suggested solo camping. It's peaceful, he said. The wilderness and silence can be healing. He gave me a list of places, but my eyes were drawn to the most remote spot, three hours hike from the last campsite in the Rocky Mountain National Park. You sure? He asked, his concern evident. I nodded, too worn out to argue. Just don't go out at night, he warned. You might not like what you find. The drive was unexpectedly soothing. The road wound through the forest, the trees blurring into greens and browns. I decided to leave my phone locked in the glove box. This trip was meant to be a break from connectivity, a chance to find peace away from the noise. I planned to be out for five days, hoping it would be enough to clear my mind. Estes Park was my last encounter with civilization. I drove through, resisting the urge to stop and book a room at the Stanley Hotel. As I entered the park, it felt like crossing into a different world. As night began to fall, I regretted leaving so late. The last thing I wanted was to hike in the dark. I found a parking area with a few tents set up, deciding to stay there for the night. I set up my own tent among the others, who soon became temporary friends. We shared food and stories, and their laughter and children playing felt comforting and normal. Wrapped in my sleeping bag, I fell asleep to their voices, the crackling fire, and the gentle rustle of the trees. That night was the last bit of peace I would have. If I had known what awaited me in the depths of the woods, I would have turned my car around and driven straight home. But I was determined, stubbornly clinging to the belief that I wasn't scared of anything. How wrong I was, 
Waking up in that parking area felt like emerging from my last good dream. I packed up my tent, said goodbye to my temporary friends, and set off toward my true destination. The deeper I went into the forest, the heavier my heart felt. Each step seemed to take me further from the world I knew and deeper into a silence that was unervingly profound. I kept thinking, it's just trees, right? Just nature. But I was mistaken. The trees seemed to watch me, moving with me. Every sound made me jump. The solitude I had longed for now felt like a suffocating blanket. I got lost frequently. What was supposed to be a three-hour hike turned into nearly six hours of cursing, sweating, and regretting my choices. When I finally reached the campsite, the sun was already setting. I hurriedly set up my tent, my hands shaking, not from the cold but from an unnamed fear. As darkness enveloped the forest, every sound grew louder. A branch snapping made me think of a horror movie jump scare. I told myself it was just animals or the wind, but those reassurances felt flimsy. I crawled into my tent, hoping sleep would distract me from the growing dread. It was a vain hope. The night was restless, filled with sounds that felt too deliberate and too close. Footsteps circled my tent, and I lay frozen, too terrified to make a sound. My imagination turned shadows into monsters and rustling leaves into whispers. I tried to convince myself it was just my unfamiliarity with the wilderness, but then came the unmistakable sound of something or someone brushing against my tent. My heart raced, and all my bravado melted away. I was terrified, no, I was petrified. The reality of my isolation hit me hard. There was no one to call for help, no one to hear me scream. I was utterly alone with whatever lurked just beyond the thin fabric of my tent. The night dragged on, an endless loop of fear and brief moments of exhausted dozing. When dawn finally broke, it felt like a temporary reprieve. But the relief was short-lived. The day brought its own challenges and fears, and as night fell again, I knew the terror would only continue. The second night in the wilderness broke something in me. Every sound was a threat, every shadow a demon. I realized that the solitude I thought would heal me was actually reflecting back my deepest fears. I was lost in a forest of my own making, and the way out seemed as mysterious as the way in. The darkness wasn't just around me, it was inside me, and I didn't know how to escape it. By the third night, I had plunged headfirst into a nightmare. Sitting in my tent, the darkness outside felt like a living, breathing entity waiting to devour me. My mind raced with every horror story I'd ever heard, each sound outside a confirmation that the worst was imminent. The fire I managed to keep alive flickered like the last spark of hope in my chest. I told myself to be rational, that it was just animals or the wind, but deep down I knew it wasn't. The footsteps returned, now joined by others, a chorus of whispers and laughter that seemed to mock my terror. Then it happened. The side of my tent was pushed in, as if something was trying to break through. My scream was swallowed by the vast forest. In a moment of panic and madness, I unzipped the tent and looked outside. What I saw will haunt me forever. A figure that resembled me, but twisted into something grotesque, with eyes like empty voids. I ran, the forest around me becoming a blur of shadows and fear. I could hear it behind me, its footsteps echoing my own terror. The trees seemed to reach out, their branches like hands trying to pull me back into the darkness. I didn't know where I was going, just that I had to keep moving. When I crashed into something solid and warm, I thought it was the end. But it was just a man claiming to be a park ranger. His suit was too clean, his shoes too polished for someone in the forest. But at that moment, I didn't care. He was my escape from the nightmare. We drove in silence, his SUV cutting through the night like a beacon of hope. When we finally stopped, dawn was just beginning to break. He handed me a card with only a number on it, no name, no title, just a lifeline. I wasn't sure if I would ever use it. After he left, 
I was alone with the rising sun, unable to shake the feeling of dread. What had I seen? Was it real or just a product of my fear-filled mind? And who was the man who claimed to be a ranger? I drove away from the mountains as quickly as I could, vowing never to return. The wilderness, once a place of beauty and wonder, now held only terror and unanswered questions. My friends noticed the change in me, but how could I explain? How do you tell someone you were chased by your own twisted reflection or that you might have encountered something supernatural? Sometimes I pull out the card the man gave me, wondering if I should call, if I should seek answers. But then I remember the laughter in the darkness, the eyes that mirrored my own but held only malice, and I realize that some things are better left unexplored. The forest has changed me. It showed me fear in its purest form, and now every shadow, every whisper of wind, brings me back to that night. I don't know if I'll ever truly escape it. Maybe we carry our forests with us, the darkness that whispers our name with a voice too much like our own. About five years ago, my partner and I went on a trip to Wyoming. I don't know how she does it, but she managed to find an incredible camping spot. Whenever I try to plan a trip, I fail miserably, which is one of the many reasons I love her. She's always organized and helps keep me on track since I'm the most indecisive person I know. We could camp pretty much anywhere in the area, so I drove our car to the perfect spot and we started setting up our tent, grill, and music along with everything else we needed to make it a great trip. We planned to stay for five nights, but we only made it through three. I'm sure anyone would have left after experiencing what we did on that third night. The first couple of days were amazing. Unlike many camping spots in the US, this part of the country felt different. Maybe it's just because I grew up on the East Coast where I think of camping as being surrounded by trees, lakes, and the kind of settings you see in old slasher movies. Instead, this area was filled with mountains, sand, and a type of plant life I wasn't used to seeing. I fell in love with it right away and made sure to enjoy every moment. Probably the best part of the trip was that we hadn't seen a single person in three days. While some might find that eerie, for us it was perfect. Then came the third night. That day had been just as great as the others. We had hiked up some trails and were more tired than usual. So we took it easy that evening and got into our tent early. I think the last time I checked my phone, it was around 9 p.m. Not long after, we both fell asleep. I woke up several hours later to my wife shaking me. Worried, I asked what was wrong, and she raised a finger to her lips, telling me to stay quiet. She was pointing outside the tent. I stayed quiet but wasn't sure what I was supposed to be hearing. She eventually mouthed to me that she thought there was an animal outside. I chuckled a little, thinking it was cute that she was scared of some animal. In hindsight, that was dumb because there are plenty of dangerous animals in the area that could have easily hurt us if they wanted to. I started listening closely, and then I heard a growl. It was the strangest growl I'd ever heard. It wasn't deep or menacing like you'd expect from a bear. Instead, it sounded weak like a creature attempting to growl but not quite getting it right. I wondered if it was a sick or dying animal. Then, I remembered an article I had read about rabid coyotes attacking people. The footsteps outside sounded light, like they were coming from something small, possibly a coyote. I didn't want to take any risks. When I heard the creature move away from the tent, I slowly unzipped the entrance and whispered to my wife to head to the truck. Once the zipper was down, we didn't see anything, so we quickly jogged over to the truck, jumped inside, and locked the doors. From there, we tried to spot whatever was making the noise. Minutes went by, but we saw no movement. Still, I knew something was out there. We had both clearly heard it. My wife started dozing off again, but this time I shook her awake, startled. What I saw was not an animal, but a person a very scruffy looking man with long, messy hair and a beard. He was hunched over and making the growling noises we had heard earlier. Anger welled up inside me, 
and I was ready to confront him. But then things got worse. Just beyond our campsite, three more men appeared. They seemed to be whispering and chuckling among themselves. Three of them were carrying large sticks, or at least that's what I thought they were. Suddenly, one of the men lifted his stick high above his head and slammed it down on our tent. I heard one of them shout, and it made me think they hadn't realized we weren't inside. My fight or flight response kicked in immediately. I started the truck and drove off as fast as I could, leaving our tent and all our things behind. I didn't even glance back at the men's faces. I just wanted to get as far away as possible. As we drove, my wife waited until we had cell service, then called the police to report what had happened. I think they connected her with a park ranger or someone like that because she got a few follow-up calls from law enforcement. We never went back for our tent or belongings, and the park ended up charging me a fee for leaving my stuff behind and cutting our reservation short. The officers were understanding, but the park's management didn't care about what we'd gone through and insisted on charging us. In the end, it was a small price to pay for getting out unharmed. I just hope those guys were caught and that no one else had to go through what we did. Many people dislike the city, but I would choose city life over the wilderness any day, especially after what happened to me and my friends about a year ago. One of my friends had recently split from her fiancé of seven years, and she was having a tough time. Of course, I couldn't blame her. Our other friend, who loves the outdoors, suggested we all go camping for a night to cheer her up. Surprisingly, she agreed to the idea. So, the three of us found a small cabin in the woods to stay for the night. I was looking forward to spending time with my friends, away from the city and all the dressing up and nightlife. However, as I expected, my recently separated friend quickly got bored. She started searching for nearby bars and found a little dive bar in the nearest town. I joked that this was my idea of camping, heading to a bar instead of staying out in the wild. It was still a fun change of scenery. The bar was quiet, mostly filled with locals, and we didn't have to deal with the usual city crowd. My friend started chatting with one of the guys at the bar. He was older but had a rugged, handsome look. Whether it was the alcohol or just her emotions from the breakup, she was flirting a lot with him. This went on for some time, but eventually, she broke off from the conversation and told us she was ready to head back to the cabin. On our way back, we teased her about the guy, and she laughed it off saying it was no big deal. When we got back to the cabin, we had one glass of wine before deciding to call it a night. It was clear by now that camping wasn't our thing. Being in a small cabin with no Wi-Fi and little to do wasn't as fun as we thought it would be. We decided to sleep in the living room together. One on the couch, one on the love seat, and one in the recliner. We all quickly fell asleep. A little after 3 a.m., I was woken up by one of my friends, who looked really worried. She said she heard the doorknob rattling. I laughed and told her she was just imagining it, but then I heard it too. It wasn't just a small shake. Someone outside was trying hard to get in. We were too scared to move, so we huddled together on the couch, holding the blanket over us. The cabin was small, and you could easily walk around the entire thing in just a minute or two. To our horror, we heard footsteps outside circling the cabin. Whoever it was, they were trying to be sneaky, but we could hear each twig snapping with every step. They made their way to the back of the cabin, right behind the couch we were lying on. There was a large window there, and we heard someone trying to open it. For some reason, I yelled, I'm calling the police. The sound stopped for a second, and then we heard a whisper from outside. It was a man's voice, and he was whispering my friend's name, the same friend who had been flirting with that guy at the bar. My mind instantly thought of him, but I couldn't believe he had followed us here. I pulled back the curtain, and there he was, standing like a deer caught in headlights. It was indeed the guy from the bar. He raised his hands defensively, like he was the one in trouble, and then ran off. 
I didn't see him get into a car or anything. He just took off into the woods. We called the police right away and reported what could have been a break-in. I'm not sure what came of it since we left early that morning, not long after the police arrived. It wasn't until we were driving home that everything really started sinking in, and we realized just how terrifying the situation was. We had returned to the cabin before midnight, and this guy didn't try to break in until after 3 a.m. That means he must have followed us, watched us for hours, waited for us to fall asleep, and then tried to get in. The thought of him lurking outside all that time still makes me sick. I'm so grateful my friend woke up when she heard the door because if she hadn't, I don't know what would have happened. Later, we found out that the window had been unlocked, and it would have been only a matter of time before he got inside. In a strange way, this experience helped my friend. She was so thankful to come out of it unharmed that it put her life into perspective, helping her begin the healing process after her breakup. A strange incident happened to me a few years back when my girlfriend, now wife, and I decided to go on a last-minute camping trip. I wasn't much of a camper, only having gone a few times with a buddy, but she had camped frequently with her family when she was younger and was eager to go again. She thought it would be a great way for us to escape the city noise where we lived and spend quality time together. She went all out and bought a bunch of cool camping gear, including a new, roomy tent. I liked that it was bigger, especially since I'm a bit larger myself. One feature I really liked about the tent, which I later learned most tents have, was a small window that allowed us to see outside. Even though I knew it would be dark, the idea of seeing out and having the morning light come in was comforting. We arrived at the remote campsite in the afternoon, planning to stay two nights. That first afternoon, we didn't do much, just set up the tent, relaxed, and went to bed early. I loved the window in the tent, and as I lay in my sleeping bag, I stared out at the beautiful night sky. As expected, the sunlight streamed through the window the next morning, and it felt like waking up in my own bed. We got up early and made the most of the day by fishing, hiking, and lounging around, reading and soaking up the sun. By evening, we were ready for another early night, which was fine with us. We weren't exactly night owls, and we were worn out from the day's activities. As we settled in for the night, I propped the window open again. While I was drifting off, I thought I saw something move outside the tent. At first, I wasn't sure if I had just nodded off for a second or if I really saw something. Before I could figure it out, my girlfriend asked, did you see that too? I told her I thought I had. We both sat up and peered out the small tent window. Everything seemed calm. Then, suddenly, my girlfriend gasped, as if all the air had been sucked out of her. I turned to see what had startled her. About 30 or 40 feet away, perched on a tree branch, was a person. They were wearing a creepy, fake mask of some famous figure and swinging their feet back and forth, like a child on a swing. We were frozen with fear. We hadn't seen a single person the entire time we'd been camping, and now, out of nowhere, there was this masked person so close to us. My heart pounded, and though I wanted to cry, I held it together for my girlfriend, who was already in tears. The person wasn't doing anything directly to us, but their presence was deeply unsettling. We watched them sit in that tree for about five minutes, which felt like an eternity. Then they jumped down. The individual didn't come closer to the tent but the sense that they might charge at us any second wouldn't go away. After pacing around for what felt like hours, the person stopped. They stood there, motionless, for what seemed like forever. Then, they turned to face the tent, and we heard muffled laughter coming from under the mask. The person began waving, not a small wave, but an exaggerated, wild motion, like they were trying to shake something loose from their arm. Suddenly, they stopped waving, and in a barely audible voice from under the mask, we heard them yell, Bye, guys! Then, without warning, 
They sprinted off into the woods at full speed. We sat there, stunned, staring out of the window all night. We may have dozed off here and there, but for the most part, we stayed awake. The person never returned, and in the morning, there was no sign of where they had come from or where they had gone. The most disturbing part was that this person clearly knew we were there. We had no idea how long they'd been sitting in that tree. Maybe minutes, maybe hours. All things considered, we were lucky since nothing physically happened to us, but the experience left us shaken. Even now, it still creeps us out when we think about it. Since that night, we've gone camping several times, but we always stay in a cabin with locked doors. It's hard to believe that this event happened over a decade ago. Time really does slip by if you're not paying attention. This experience was one of the strangest and most terrifying things I've ever been through. At the time, I had just started dating my girlfriend, and because of our busy schedules, we hardly ever saw each other. I was in my early 20s back then, and I really just wanted some alone time with her. But that opportunity never seemed to come. We were both still living with our parents, so finding private moments was difficult. We hadn't been together long, but I was already getting frustrated. Felt like she always had plans, and I was just an afterthought. One weekend, I expressed how I felt, and she told me that she had already made plans for a camping trip with her friends and couldn't hang out. I was livid and on the verge of ending things before they had a chance to really begin. That same day, she left for the trip but later texted me, saying her friends had agreed I could come if I wanted. I'm not a fan of camping, but I wasn't going to pass up a chance to be with her. The campsite was only about 40 minutes away, so I packed up and headed out. When I arrived, it wasn't what I expected. The site wasn't deep in the woods, but more like a big open area with lots of other people around. Felt crowded, and not at all like the camping I imagined. Nonetheless, I finally met all her friends, and they were fun, loud, and outgoing. Completely different from my girlfriend, who was much quieter and reserved. As the evening went on, I noticed there were plenty of trails nearby, and I decided to take a walk. As I wandered down the paths, I started to get a real sense of how expansive the area was, and for the first time, it felt like proper camping. Later that night, we grilled some food and played card games as the sun went down. We even had a few drinks, though we had to hide our beers since alcohol wasn't technically allowed. Around 11 p.m., two people, who I assumed were rangers, came over to our area. They shined their flashlights at us and asked why we were still awake. We all laughed, confused by the question. One of the guys in our group responded sarcastically, saying, why wouldn't we be? We're on vacation and just hanging out. One of the rangers immediately snapped back, saying there was a strict 10 p.m. curfew and all lights had to be out. We thought it was a joke, but the ranger wasn't playing. My girlfriend's friend, who had spoken before, replied with frustration, saying she paid good money for the site and didn't intend to go to sleep early. The ranger wasn't having it and basically scolded us like kids. They warned us that if we didn't follow the rules, we'd be kicked out. Feeling irritated, we all retreated to our tents. One of the group suggested we quietly meet up in a tent to continue playing cards. However, the ranger overheard this and immediately came back, sternly telling us that lights out meant no more cards, no more talking. It was time for bed. They warned that if they caught us awake again, we'd be out. Feeling like kids being disciplined, we grumbled but complied. Since we had been drinking, we didn't want to risk getting kicked out, especially because no one was in any shape to drive. Eventually, most people dozed off, but my girlfriend and I stayed awake, enjoying the rare alone time. She then suggested something surprising, sneaking off onto one of the trails to really get some privacy. Being in my early 20s, I was all for it. We quietly slipped out of the tent and made our way to one of the nearby paths. 
after walking far enough to feel alone, we started to enjoy our time together. But that moment was cut short when we heard a loud, hey, from behind us. We froze, trying not to make any noise, thinking it might be one of the rangers. Then we heard the voice again, I know you're there, I just want to say hi. We looked at each other, confused. What did that even mean? I peeked around a tree and, even though it was nearly pitch black, I could see a strange looking man standing on the trail with a small flashlight. He was short and wearing a baggy white shirt. As soon as he saw me, he smiled and said, Hey buddy, I've got something for you. The situation felt off and I immediately felt a knot of tension in my gut. I didn't say anything, unsure how to respond. Then the man said something that made no sense. I've got a bunch of money on me and my ex-wife's going to take it. I want to give it away before she finds out. Why don't you come over here and take it? He stretched out his hand, though there was nothing in it, and stood about 20 feet away. I looked at my girlfriend and mouthed, Run! The second she took off, I followed. As I started running, I glanced back and saw the man lunge toward us, yelling something like, No! But we were already sprinting, putting distance between us and him. We made it back to the campsite without looking back. After about an hour, the rangers came around for another check, and I flagged down the same woman who had yelled at us earlier. I told her about the man I saw, though I lied and said I had spotted him from the tent. She believed me and called the authorities. That was the last I saw of the creepy guy. For the rest of the night, I kept my eyes fixed on the trails, half expecting to see him again, but thankfully, he never reappeared. To this day, I have no idea what his true intentions were, but the look in his eyes when we ran is something I'll never forget. Every year, when camping season rolls around, I think back to that night and feel grateful that we managed to get away safely. There's a reason I always hesitate when people suggest camping. It's not that I hate nature or the outdoors. I just prefer sleeping in a comfortable bed instead of on the ground in a tent. But this one year, my boyfriend convinced me to go camping with the promise that we'd stay in a cabin so I could have that bed. I still pushed for the beach, but at least I wouldn't be roughing it in a tent. The trip was planned with two other couples, making six of us in total. We found a cozy, mostly secluded cabin in the woods, just a short walk from a picturesque lake perfect for swimming. Though I wouldn't admit it, I was starting to warm up to the idea once we arrived. The first day was incredible. We spent the entire day hiking trails, swimming in the lake, and grilling steaks in the evening. The day ended with us heading to bed around midnight. I didn't sleep well, though. I kept hearing noises outside all night but I convinced myself it was just my imagination. After all, we were deep in the woods, and strange sounds aren't exactly unexpected. The next morning, as we were preparing for a hike, we were greeted by a cheerful voice from behind. Hey there, how's it going today? My boyfriend, ever the social one, immediately started chatting with the man. He introduced himself as Wade and claimed to know all the trails around the area. The interaction was a bit odd, but nothing too alarming. He mentioned he lived nearby and had heard us, so he wanted to check in and make sure we were settling in fine. It felt nice that someone would do that, though his sudden appearance was a little strange. Wade was a big guy, easily over six feet tall with a bit of a belly. He had a backpack, hiking boots, and jeans, looking like any regular local enjoying the trails. After some friendly talk, he laughed in a booming voice and went on his way. We joked about Wade for a bit as we hiked, but nothing seemed out of the ordinary. Later that afternoon, we headed back to the lake to swim. While we were lounging on the dock, soaking up the sun, we suddenly heard that same voice again. There you all are. We jumped, startled. Standing at the edge of the dock was Wade, once again. We asked him what he was doing 
and he claimed he was just passing by. My boyfriend shrugged it off, chatting with him a little more, but one of my friends and I were feeling uneasy. Wade just kept laughing and looking around. After some small talk, he wandered off, mumbling to himself. That night, as we gathered around the campfire sharing spooky stories, I felt increasingly uncomfortable. Out of nowhere, Wade suddenly burst from the bushes, yelling, Here I am! Followed by his usual loud laughter, we all nearly jumped out of our skin. My boyfriend, now irritated, told Wade off, saying scaring us like that wasn't cool and that he should just leave us alone. Wade seemed upset, insisting he was just trying to make our trip memorable. He eventually left, but I couldn't shake the feeling that something wasn't right, especially since it was so late at night. The incident soured the mood, and we soon decided to call it a night. As we cleaned up the cabin, I confessed to my boyfriend that I had a bad feeling about Wade. I couldn't help but think the noises I'd heard the previous night might have been him lurking around. That night, I struggled to fall asleep. Sometime in the middle of the night, I heard footsteps and heavy breathing outside our window. I shook my boyfriend awake, begging him to check. He groggily got up but quickly turned pale. He whispered to me that someone was pacing outside, and he was sure it was Wade. I peeked out and saw Wade muttering to himself and pacing back and forth. He tried the door handle, but it was locked. Frustrated, he started hitting his own head before eventually walking off into the woods. We were terrified and didn't know what to do. My boyfriend called the cabin's owner and the police. When the officer arrived, we explained the whole situation, but he didn't seem too concerned, just nodding along as we spoke felt like he wasn't taking us seriously. We packed up our things and stayed awake until dawn. As soon as the sun rose, we loaded up the van and left. As we were driving down the main road, we spotted Wade walking alone, still talking to himself and occasionally hitting his head. We informed the police dispatcher, but I never found out if they caught up with him or if he just disappeared back into the woods. I'm just grateful we got out unharmed. From now on, though, I'm done with camping. Everyone else can go without me. So, I'm finally putting this down, just hours after the wildest experience of my life. I know it might sound a bit exaggerated, but at the moment, it truly felt unreal. My family and I had just arrived at our campsite for the week, and I'm still on edge, glancing over my shoulder every few minutes, even though deep down I think everything's fine. I'll do my best to retell it, as this is my first time recalling it since it all happened. Late last night, my family and I left home to start our week-long camping trip. Our two kids were beyond excited to join us for the first time on one of our outdoor adventures. My spouse and I have been camping for years, but we waited until our kids were old enough to handle it. Finally, the time had come for them to join us. We set out on a six-hour drive, a little after 11 p.m. After the initial excitement and the mini-concert in our vehicle, everyone eventually drifted off to sleep. Everyone except me, of course. That gave me some quiet time to listen to an audiobook I hadn't had the chance to get into for a while. I was surprised to find that we were almost at our destination, and my family had slept through most of the drive. They woke up here and there, asking where we were, but for the most part, they stayed knocked out. Then, about 25 minutes from our campsite, I hit a dreaded flat tire, something no driver wants, especially on a vacation. Luckily, I had a spare, so this was more of an inconvenience than anything though I was still frustrated. I remember feeling a bit shaken as I briefly lost control of the car, sliding to the shoulder of the road before regaining it. Despite the commotion, my family remained asleep. Quietly, I stepped out, moved some bags to access the spare tire, and began to change it. As I worked, I started wondering what caused the flat since it seemed to happen out of nowhere. Felt odd, almost suspicious. 
I had just finished swapping the tire when I heard a soft throat clear. Like someone was trying to get my attention, I turned around, expecting to see my spouse, but instead, there was a petite woman standing there, her hair in wild braids and a tattoo of a flower on her neck. Hey! She greeted me in a calm, almost sweet voice. I'm Anna. Looks like you could use a hand. Caught off guard, I responded politely but nervously. Uh, thanks, but I think I've got it. She gave me a smile, but something felt off. She kept glancing toward the side of the road like she was signaling to someone. Each time I looked, though, there was nothing. She continued offering to help, her voice staying polite, but I kept refusing. I was polite at first, but I couldn't shake the feeling that something wasn't right. As I packed up my tools and prepared to leave, she suddenly changed her tone. Her voice turned sharp, almost aggressive. I really think you need my help. No, I don't, I replied firmly, feeling my patience were thin. Look, I've got a family in the car and I'm not dealing with this right now. You need to leave or I'm calling the cops. Instead of backing off, she started laughing. At this point, I had had enough. I turned to get in the truck, putting the keys where I could quickly start the engine. But as I turned back to grab my wrench, she was mid-swing, aiming right at my head. I managed to catch the blow in time and kicked her in the leg, knocking her off balance. She grunted, then scrambled away toward the direction she had been eyeing earlier. Without wasting another second, I jumped into the truck and sped off. I checked the mirrors constantly, looking for any sign of her or a car following us, but the rest of the drive went smoothly, thank goodness. When my spouse woke up, I told them what happened. They were furious that I didn't call the police right away, but they also didn't entirely believe me. Once we got to the campsite, they made the call and gave the police a full description of the woman, her name, the tattoo, and the road where she appeared. Now, I can't shake the feeling that she's going to find us. She clearly saw the camping gear in the truck and knew where we were headed. And though I have no solid proof, I can't help but think she had something to do with the flat tire. I'm trying to enjoy the rest of our trip, but I wanted to get this story down while the details were still fresh in my mind. I can't stop wondering what her plan was. Did she want to steal the truck? Rob me? Or was it something worse? Wish me luck. If anything new happens or the police give us any updates, I'll be sure to share. But for now, I hope I never see Anna with that flower tattoo ever again. The story took place about 14 years ago when my parents let me have two of my best friends over for a sleepover. They set up a tent in the backyard for us to camp out. My mom stocked up on snacks and my dad ordered pizza and drinks before heading out for dinner. We were so excited to be out in the tent, dragging as much food as we could outside and starting to eat while chatting. We went over our plans for the night, scary stories, esmores and whatever else came to mind. After eating as much pizza as we could, we started talking about our crushes and whether we'd have the courage to ask them to dance when school started the next year. At one point, we tried setting up a blanket and pillow fort inside the tent, but we failed miserably. All the while, I had this strange feeling like I could hear something outside the tent. I unzipped the window screen to look outside, but I didn't see anything. A few minutes later, my friend mentioned hearing something too, like something brushing against the tent. My other friend, Audrey, peeked out the window and suddenly said, Do you see that black thing over there? I looked and saw something that looked like a white Nike symbol flash by. I couldn't help but scream, and then both of my friends started screaming too. We bolted for the house and ran straight into the bathroom, locking ourselves in. We tried to stay as quiet as possible, but then we heard footsteps and the bathroom door handle started to jiggle. We all screamed at the top of our lungs and Audrey was frantically calling the police. Just then, I heard my mom's voice saying we could come out. 
Slowly, we opened the door, and there were my parents, standing there with smiles. My dad apologized and took the phone from Audrey, explaining to the dispatcher, Sorry, this is her father. I was just playing a prank on the girls during their sleepover. Looking back now, I'm surprised the cops didn't show up, but it's a small town and my dad probably knew the officers. Though we were upset at first, we got over it pretty quickly since my dad was always playing jokes. He helped us with the fire for our esmores, put on some music, and kept asking if we needed anything from the store, probably feeling guilty for scaring us so badly. Eventually, we got tired and headed back to the tent to sleep. I remember staying up the longest, wanting to make sure my friends were comfortable before I dozed off. But later, I woke up to pitch black darkness and the sound of crickets. At first, I thought I heard something, but I figured it was just a dream. As I was trying to fall back asleep, I noticed one of my friends was snoring really loudly, and it seemed to get even louder. Curious, I sat up to see which friend was making the noise. That's when I was eye level with the tent's window screen and had a flashback to earlier. Something moved outside the tent, and suddenly, I heard the zipper of the tent door opening. I yelled, Dad, stop it. Enough with the pranks. My friends won't want to come over again. But there was no response and my friends started to wake up. Frustrated, I said again, Dad, leave us alone, please. And then I heard a voice, not my dad's, but a much deeper one say, how do you know it's me? I froze. All I could think to do was grab my friends and drag them out of the tent. We ran inside without saying a word, my friends more confused than scared. I went straight to my parents' room and told my dad what had happened. He jumped out of bed immediately and went outside. I could hear him shouting something before coming back in to call the police. My mom stayed with us while my dad waited outside. Soon, police lights flashed outside and my dad spoke with the officers for about 20 minutes. When he came back, he told us that someone had been causing trouble in the neighborhood. But luckily, they caught the guy and we were safe. My dad apologized for scaring us earlier and said he was relieved we were okay. He asked if my friends wanted to call their parents or go home. Audrey was fine and wanted to stay, but my other friend, May, called her mom and went home. Audrey and I decided to move our little camping adventure to the living room, and my dad helped us build a pillow and blanket fort. There were only a few hours until morning, and we eventually got up for breakfast. My parents asked if we wanted a pool day, and it was exactly what we needed to get our minds off the night before. Audrey and I are still friends to this day, and I don't think either of us has been camping since then. This took place when I was in middle school. During the summer, my parents signed me up for an all-boys summer camp that lasted a month. The camp was set up deep in the forest, with six or seven small cabins spread around. There was a lake nearby, some fire pits, and if I remember correctly, even a sand volleyball court. The place was about four hours away from town. It was old and worn out, but still used for summer camps. When we arrived, I unpacked my things in one of the cabins and set up my bed. A few of the kids I'd be staying with wanted to explore the forest before we had to return for dinner. The camp had loose rules. We were allowed to go as far as we wanted, as long as we could still see the cabins. As we were walking, one of the kids pointed out a person in the distance. It was an older man, probably over 50, standing a few yards away and staring in our direction. He looked disheveled, like he hadn't taken care of himself in a while. His clothes were dirty, and he had a scruffy gray beard. We just assumed he was one of the camp staff. He gave us a strange smile, and I gave him an awkward wave in return. Later that evening, we mentioned him to one of the camp counselors, who seemed to take it seriously and went out to check the area. By then, the man was gone. Over the next few days, we didn't venture far into the woods again. We were all still a bit spooked. Most of the camp counselors were teenagers, no older than 30, and it became clear they had no idea who the man was. 
Then, on the fourth night, things got much worse. I woke up to the sound of our cabin door handle rattling. Every night at around 11 p.m., one of the counselors would knock on the cabins to remind us to lock our doors and go to sleep. I figured this was what was happening, but I had no clock to tell the time, so I wasn't sure. Being the only one awake, I shouted something about how we were already in bed. Right after I called out, a flashlight turned on outside, and the beam started scanning through the cabin windows. Someone was clearly trying to look inside. A few of the other kids began waking up, and I motioned for them to stay quiet and stay low. The person outside circled the cabin several times, shining the flashlight through each window. I don't know if they saw me, but I felt the light pass over me more than once. After what felt like forever, the flashlight turned off and everything went silent again. I explained to the others what had happened. One of the kids had a watch and checked the time. It was 4 a.m., far too late for it to have been a counselor. We stayed awake until morning. When one of the teenage counselors came to wake us for breakfast, we told him everything that happened. He took us straight to the adult counselors where we repeated our story. What they told us next was terrifying. That same night, a kid from another cabin had gone for a walk to use the bathroom. On his way back, he noticed someone near one of the cabin doors. At first, he thought it was a counselor, but then he saw the person was trying to pick the lock. When asked to describe the man, the kid said it was dark but remembered him having a beard and wearing filthy clothes. It sounded just like the man we saw on the first day. The camp was immediately shut down for safety reasons. That afternoon, a bus came to take all of us home. Years later, I did some research and found a brief report about the incident. After we left, the police searched the area and found a small tent hidden nearby. Inside, they found basic camping supplies and hundreds of Polaroid pictures of the camp. Photos of the cabins, the lake, the fire pits, and most disturbingly, photos of the kids. Many were taken from a distance and some were shot at night through the cabin windows. The police waited for someone to return to the tent, but no one ever did. The man was never caught. It was late summer, and my partner and I decided to go camping one last time before the weather started to cool off. I had a bunch of camping equipment left from when I used to go with friends during college and thought it would be a good chance to use it again. There was a particular spot we liked to visit, not an official campground, just a secluded area we had discovered before. I thought it would be perfect to show my partner. When we arrived, we noticed an old fire pit and some trash, clearly showing that others had found the place, too. We didn't mind, though. We set up our tent and got a fire going. For hours, we sat by the fire, talking and enjoying some drinks. Around 2 a.m., we were startled by the sudden sound of what seemed like a chainsaw starting up. That's exactly what it sounded like. At first, we thought maybe someone was cutting down a tree, but we couldn't figure out why anyone would be doing that in the middle of the night. Then, out of nowhere, we heard creepy laughter that followed the noise. Now we were genuinely freaked out. We quickly put out the fire and got inside our tent. The sound seemed far away, so we felt relatively safe and we had a machete with us, just in case. But over the next few minutes, it really seemed like the sounds were getting closer. Thankfully, after a while, the noise stopped abruptly and we both felt relieved. After about 30 minutes of silence, we thought it was safe enough to try and get some sleep. Surprisingly, we fell asleep pretty quickly, probably helped by the drinks we had earlier. I don't know what time it was, but something woke me up during the night. I didn't know why at first, but then I heard footsteps. I sat up to listen, and I saw that my partner had already done the same. We looked at each other, listening carefully. There were multiple footsteps, and they sounded close, no more than 20 yards away. My partner suggested we run for the car, but I told her we should wait a little longer. The moonlight was bright that night, and I could see shadows on the wall of the tent. 
three figures walking around outside. I didn't tell her, not wanting to scare her more than she already was, but I quietly grabbed the machete, mentally preparing myself for the worst. Time seemed to drag on, but finally the shadows started to move away. As soon as they were gone, I told my partner it was time to leave. We left everything behind, unzipped the tent, and ran to the car as fast as we could. I was grateful we had a key fob to start the car remotely. I had it running by the time we jumped in, and I hit the gas without looking back. Once we were safely driving away, I told her about the figures I had seen outside the tent. She was furious that I hadn't mentioned it earlier. We spent the night in a hotel instead. The next morning, we went back to the campsite. Everything we had left was gone. Not a single item remained. I'm still not sure what really happened that night. Maybe we unknowingly set up camp on someone's private land, and this was their twisted way of scaring us off. Or maybe those people had something far worse in mind. Either way, they now have all of our camping gear. I don't think we'll be going camping again anytime soon. When I was 18 and still pretty naive, a few friends and I decided to ride our bikes from New York to Los Angeles. We set off around Labor Day and ended up in the Southwest in the fall, where most tourist attractions were already closed for the season. We didn't follow any well-known routes, just kind of improvised with the roadmaps we picked up each time we crossed a state border. Each day, we'd pick a destination town to meet up at, then head out at our own pace, rendezvousing at the end of the day to find a place to camp. One day, after camping the night before, we decided to meet up in a town about 60 miles away, though I can't recall its exact name. There wasn't much between where we started and this town, so we hoped there'd be a diner or at least a store when we got there. That's one of the risks of stealth camping. You never know what you'll find, if anything at all. Will there be a gas station? Will someone catch us? Could we get into trouble? Might someone steal our stuff? The ride itself went smoothly, and we all met up in the town. But to our surprise, the entire place was abandoned, completely empty. Nothing was open and we didn't see a soul. It felt like the whole town was boarded up and left to rot. Riding around, we eventually found an old, deserted bar. It seemed like a good idea at the time to move our bikes inside and camp there for the night. After all, it seemed like no one would notice or care since there didn't appear to be anyone around for miles. As we started bringing our bikes in, we heard a voice behind us. What are you boys doing here? It was deep and unexpected. And when we turned around, there stood a tall guy in a cowboy hat, looking at us with curiosity. We quickly explained we were biking across the country, thought the bar was empty, and asked if we could crash there for the night. We weren't necessarily scared of him, it was more the realization that we were obviously trespassing in the middle of nowhere, Texas. The guy listened, nodded, and said only, wait here. He then drove off, leaving us pretty concerned. But since we had nowhere else to go, we waited as instructed, wondering what would happen next. The situation had a weird vibe, almost like something out of a horror movie. About 10 minutes later, the guy returned with a shorter man and a pit bull. At first, we were nervous, but they introduced themselves. I don't remember their names, but I'll never forget the dog's name was Butch. The short guy was the owner of the bar, and they were there to invite some friends over for a small party. Before we knew it, they pulled out a cooler filled with beer and steaks. The party kicked off and we found ourselves eating free food, drinking free beer, and hanging out with some rough-looking locals. What started as a spooky encounter turned into one of the coolest nights of the trip in about 15 minutes. As the night went on, we switched from beer to whiskey and got pretty hammered. The locals joked about how we wouldn't be able to ride our bikes the next day, which at the time seemed hilarious to us. The party lasted late into the night. Around 2 a.m., the cowboy said he needed to close up the bar 
so we helped clean up a bit and settled down on the floor to sleep. The others left, and the bar owner locked up before heading out, saying he'd be back in the morning. We passed out hard, completely knocked out from all the drinking. Sometime later, I woke up to a strange vibration in the floor. I thought one of my friends was up to use the bathroom, but when I looked around, they were all still asleep. Then I heard footsteps, boots scuffing against the floor. None of us had been wearing shoes. Hello, I called out. The cowboy guy answered, and before I knew it, a flashlight beam was in my face, blinding me. As I tried to get up, I saw that he was naked, save for his cowboy hat and boots. My friend, startled, asked, what's going on? Sure enough, the guy was standing there, stark naked and clearly drunk. I glanced at my watch. It had only been an hour since we had fallen asleep. The guy had come back in a drunken state, stripped down and, for reasons none of us wanted to find out, was standing there like that. Come on, let's have a little fun, boys, he slurred. We freaked out, grabbed our stuff as quickly as possible, and bolted for the door. Thankfully, the guy was too drunk to follow us properly. We ran outside, where his truck was parked with the engine running and the door open. We threw our gear over our shoulders and biked away as fast as we could, though we weren't moving too quickly with our bags falling off and still being somewhat drunk ourselves. We made it about a mile out of town before stumbling upon an empty barn. It was falling apart, full of rotten hay and rusty farm equipment, but we hid our bikes and climbed up into the rafters to sleep for a few hours. At dawn, we heard a truck cruising along the dirt roads outside. It was the same guy probably trying to find us, but we waited until he was gone, then quickly packed up and left. For the rest of the trip, we did our best to avoid any more encounters like that. I should have known better than to get caught up in the stealth camping trend, but at the time it seemed like the perfect way to spice up an otherwise dull cross-country road trip. I'd been reading about it on various forums and watching stories from YouTubers who vanished into the shadows, blending into cityscapes for a night without anyone noticing. The idea was appealing. No motels, no fees, just me and the thrill of the unknown. It was meant to be simple, drive, sleep, drive some more. I planned to visit a few friends and then head back home in about five days. Two full days of driving each way, and I figured breaking up the trip with some stealth camping would make it more memorable. What's life without a little risk, right? I had done my homework and mapped out some spots that seemed secluded enough for a night. I even prepared a small camping kit with just the essentials. But as these stories often go, things didn't go as planned. My plans took a turn for the worse as soon as I arrived in that small town, much later than expected. It was nearly midnight, and I was exhausted from driving all day. The route had been straightforward until I reached the town and found that the green belt I was counting on had been cleared for some new development. Excavators and piles of dirt replaced the lush bushes and trees. I muttered a curse under my breath. I had hoped that spot would be a surefire win, easy access, plenty of cover, low chance of being spotted. But now that was out of the question. No worries, I told myself. I just needed to stay calm and adapt. I drove around for a while, scanning the dark streets and parking lots for an alternative. Soon, I found what I thought might work, a dry wash between two commercial areas. It seemed perfect, dark, overgrown with thick brush, and enough cover to stay hidden. I parked the car in an inconspicuous spot behind an old strip mall, grabbed my gear, a sleeping bag, a flashlight, and some food, and made my way to the wash. The deeper I went, the more secluded it became. No sane person would venture here at this hour, or so I thought. About a quarter mile in, I found a dense thicket of bushes. The canopy of branches made it hard to see the sky, but it was secluded enough to feel hidden. I set up quickly, 
using my flashlight to check for snakes or other potential hazards. Everything seemed clear, so I laid out my sleeping bag and tucked my backpack next to me. I relaxed with a joint, taking long drags while listening to the distant hum of traffic, the chirping of crickets, and the steady drone of nearby air conditioners. There was something oddly peaceful about it all, urban camping under the stars, surrounded by muffled sounds of life just beyond reach. The weed was working its magic, and I soon felt myself drifting off. But I didn't sleep for long. I woke up suddenly, my heart racing, unsure of what had jolted me awake. Then I heard it crunch, 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 footsteps getting closer and closer. I tensed, straining to listen. It wasn't just one person. There were multiple sets of footsteps. I stayed perfectly still, barely daring to breathe. From my spot in the brush, I saw a figure emerge, backlit by the faint glow of distant streetlights. It was a man walking a large dog, a pit bull that was straining at its leash. The dog suddenly stopped, sniffing the air intensely, and began pulling its owner towards my hiding spot. Panic surged in my chest. There was no way I wouldn't be found now. I curled up tighter, praying that the shadows and bushes would conceal me. I could hear the man muttering to the dog, tugging at the leash trying to redirect it. But the dog kept pulling, sniffing the ground as if it was homing in on something or someone. For what felt like forever, I lay there, muscles tense with fear, my heart pounding so hard I thought it might burst. Then, miraculously, the man managed to pull the dog away. Come on, just leave it, he shouted, dragging the dog back the way they had come. Gradually, their footsteps faded into the distance, swallowed by the night. I exhaled a breath I didn't realize I'd been holding. I was trembling, drenched in sweat. I had a moment to pack up and get out of there, but I convinced myself it was a one-off. A single person out for a late night walk, nothing to worry about. My heart eventually calmed and the night grew quiet again. The distant sounds of traffic and chirping crickets lulled me back into a false sense of safety. But that was a mistake. As I started to drift off again, a sudden feeling of being watched made me sit up quickly. I turned and squinted into the darkness and that's when I saw him a man standing a few feet away, partially hidden in the shadows. My blood ran cold. He was staring straight at me, grinning. His face was dirty, hair matted, teeth looking like yellow shards with one front tooth gleaming gold in the dim light. Nice spot you got here, he rasped, his voice like gravel. You know this is mine, right? You prick. I was too stunned to respond initially. My brain was racing, trying to process what I was seeing and how this guy had sneaked up on me. I, I didn't mean to take your spot, man. I'm sorry. I stammered, scrambling to grab my things. I'll leave, just let me. No, you don't have to go anywhere. He interrupted, taking a step closer. I just want to talk to you, that's all. There was something in his tone and the way he moved that made my skin crawl. I could feel the danger radiating off him like heat from a fire. He was too calm, too confident. I didn't think I was dealing with a harmless vagrant, but someone who genuinely wanted to harm me. Someone who had hurt others before. He reached into his pocket, and my heart skipped a beat. Slowly, he pulled out a knife, a rusty, old, grimy blade. He held it casually, like it was a toy. You know, it's pretty dangerous out here at night he said with that twisted grin never leaving his face. You just never know who you might run into. I didn't wait for him to make a move. Fight or flight kicked in and I bolted. I grabbed what I could my bag, the flashlight, and ran through the underbrush as fast as I could. Behind me, I could hear him laughing, a high-pitched, almost childlike giggle. He was chasing me, skipping along as if it were a twisted game. He hummed an eerie, off-key tune that sent shivers down my spine. I ran like mad, adrenaline surging, lungs burning as I made for the spot where I had parked my car. I could hear him closing in, his footsteps light and quick, 
just behind me. The wash was a maze of shadows and debris, and I stumbled more than once, nearly face-planting into the gravel, but I kept going, driven by sheer terror. When I finally reached the bridge, I glanced over my shoulder, and he was gone, vanished into the darkness as if he had never been there. I didn't stop to question it. I scrambled up the slope, jumped into my car, and sped away without a second thought. It wasn't until I was miles away, my heart still racing, that I allowed myself to breathe again. My hands were shaking, my mind racing with a thousand what-ifs. What if he had caught me? What if I hadn't woken up in time? What if he was still out there, waiting for someone else to stumble into his twisted game? I shivered at the memory of that crooked knife. I had never been so relieved to see the glow of a highway sign. I kept driving until the sun started to rise, until I was far, far away from that cursed place. I didn't stop until I reached a crowded truck stop, surrounded by the reassuring noise of people, lights, and civilization. Stealth camping? Never again. I take a cheap motel over that death trap in the dark any day. Whatever thrill I thought I'd find was not worth the danger I narrowly escaped. To this day, whenever I hear a faint, eerie tune, it takes me right back to that night. The man with the knife and that awful grin lurking in the shadows. Jamie and I had been stealth camping since our university days when adventures were cheaper than staying in a motel and far more thrilling. We'd sharpened our skills over the years, perfecting the art of blending into park green belts and forgotten lots. It became our tradition, a way to travel light, save money, and have tales to share. To be honest, the scariest encounter we'd had was just an overly curious raccoon trying to get at our food stash. We took pride in being clever, careful, and, most importantly, invisible. However, there was one night that still gives me chills whenever I think about it. We were on a road trip through the Pacific Northwest, planning to visit as many national parks and forests as possible. Our days were spent hiking trails, relaxing by lakes, and soaking in the scenery. By night, we'd find a quiet spot to set up camp. This particular night was no different. We arrived in a small town that seemed frozen in time. Rows of aging storefronts, a lone gas station, and old houses that leaned with the weight of years. It was late summer, warm and dry, with a clear sky full of stars. Jamie suggested we check out a public park on the edge of town. From the road, it looked perfect. Lots of trees, a creek running through it, and best of all, no one else around. We parked in a gravel lot near the entrance, grabbed our hammocks, and followed a narrow trail that ran alongside the creek. It led us to a small clearing surrounded by towering firs. The branches were thick enough to block out most of the light, casting everything in deep blue and black. The only sign of human presence was a crooked wooden fence, half rotten and overgrown with vines, barely visible through the trees. It seemed to mark the edge of someone's property, but there were no lights, and we didn't see a house. It was far enough away that we didn't worry about it. We found a spot a bit off the trail, set up our hammocks, and settled in for a quiet night under the stars. We had a quick, cold dinner, some sandwiches and fruit, then lay back in the larger hammock, watching the sky through the gaps in the branches. The only sounds were the gentle bubbling of the creek, the rustling of leaves in the breeze, and the occasional hoot of an owl. It was peaceful. We'd done this so many times that stealth camping felt second nature. At some point, we must have drifted off because I woke up in the dark, my first thought being that I might have heard something, a subtle, out-of-place noise. I stayed still and listened, but all I could hear were the usual night sounds. Just as I was about to dismiss it, Jamie stirred beside me. Hey, did you hear that? He whispered. I nodded. Even though I hadn't heard anything specific, his voice was tense, the kind of whisper that puts your nerves on edge. 
What is it? I asked, barely daring to breathe. I've been hearing footsteps for a while, Jamie said. That woke me up fast. I strained my ears and caught a faint shuffling sound, almost like someone dragging their feet. It was slow and deliberate, definitely not an animal. My heart started racing as I scanned the darkness around us. The trees cast long shadows that seemed to shift with every gust of wind. Then, in the dim light filtering through the branches, I saw movement, a figure stumbling between the trees. It was an old woman, her hair wild and matted, her clothes hanging like loose rags. She moved erratically, taking a few steps forward and then doubling back, her arms hanging limply at her sides. At first, I thought she was lost or confused. Maybe she had wandered off from somewhere nearby, but there was something about her movement, jerky and unnatural, like she was being pulled along by invisible strings. We dared not make a sound, lying there watching as she staggered closer. Her face was barely visible in the dim light. I held my breath, hoping she would pass by and leave us alone. Instead, she stopped near a larger tree, glanced around nervously, and crouched down as if trying to hide. She pressed herself against the trunk and went completely still. We lost sight of her. The silence that followed was suffocating. My mind raced, trying to understand what we had just seen. Who was she? Why was she out here in the middle of the night acting like that? And more importantly, where was she now? I couldn't shake the feeling that she was still there, just out of sight, watching us. Minutes dragged by, the tension in the air almost palpable. Jamie's grip on my arm tightened, and I could tell he was just as freaked out as I was. Neither of us wanted to move until we were sure she was gone. Then, out of nowhere, there was more movement, this time louder, heavier. Two men appeared, striding out of the park and into the trees as if they knew exactly where they were going. They wore dark, rough-looking clothes, and their purposeful stride made my stomach knot with dread. They weren't out here for a casual stroll. They were looking for something or someone. Jamie and I huddled together, barely daring to peek over the edge of the hammock as they got closer. They stopped near the tree where the old woman had hidden. I heard them muttering to each other in urgent tones, like they were arguing. One of them raised a hand and motioned toward the tree. Then, without warning, they began beating at the underbrush, kicking at the bushes, all the while whispering harshly. I clapped my hand over my mouth, terrified of making any noise. Finally, after what felt like an eternity, one of them barked something, and the old woman crawled out from her hiding spot. She looked even more pitiful up close, trembling as she pulled herself to her feet. One of the men grabbed her by the arm, pulling her up. She wobbled, barely able to stand. They seemed indifferent to her plight, patting her off and dusting dirt from her clothes. One of them slapped her hard enough to make her stumble. She didn't cry out, just flinched and kept her head down. Keep in sight this time. One of them snapped, his voice gruff with an edge of cruelty that sent chills down my spine. They marched her back the way they came, forcing her to stay between them as they headed towards the park. Before they left, they paused and scanned the area, their eyes sweeping over the trees, the bushes, and us. I felt their gaze like a knife, even from that distance, searching for something or making sure no one was watching. Their eyes finally settled on our hammock. I thought my heart would stop. They stared at it, whispering to each other again, and for a terrifying moment, I thought they would come over and check it out. After a tense exchange, they shrugged it off and continued moving, taking the woman away into the shadows. We stayed frozen, barely daring to breathe until we were sure they were gone. My mind was racing with a hundred different questions, none of which had good answers. Who were those men? What were they doing with the woman? Why were they out here in the middle of the night dragging her around like that? The moment they were out of sight, Jamie and I scrambled to pack up our camp, our hands shaking as we gathered our gear. We didn't speak, 
Not daring to turn on a light, I kept expecting them to come back and find us. My chest was tight with fear, my breath shallow and ragged. I had never felt so exposed, so vulnerable. We bolted back to the trail, the night now feeling far more menacing than peaceful. When we reached our car, Jamie fumbled with the keys, dropping them twice before finally unlocking the door. We jumped in, locked the doors, and sped away as if the devil himself was on our tail. It wasn't until we were halfway down the highway that we even dared to talk about what had just happened. We agreed we needed to report it. I wasn't sure what to expect when I called the local police, but their response was indifferent at best. The dispatcher took our information, said they would send someone to check it out, but that was it, no follow-up, no questions. I got the distinct feeling they weren't surprised by our description, like it was just another incident in a long list of things they had already seen. We didn't stick around to find out. We drove until we reached the next town and found a cheap motel. That night, we lay awake, replaying the events in our heads, trying to make sense of it all. But the more we thought about it, the more unsettling it became. The old woman's hollow eyes, her puppet-like movements, the cruelty of those men. It was a nightmare come to life, one that we could barely process. It wasn't just the strangeness of the situation that haunted us, but the implications. What if we hadn't stayed silent? What if we had tried to intervene or even just made our presence known? Those men clearly weren't out there to help her. They were controlling her somehow. Who knows what they were planning or how many others they had harmed before. The thought of being caught in their sights made my skin crawl. The next morning, the sun was bright, as if nothing was wrong in the world, but the fear still clung to us. We were quieter than usual as we packed up our things to hit the road. The radio played softly in the background, doing little to cut through the oppressive tension. Jamie finally broke the silence. Do you think that was some kind of trafficking? He asked, his voice barely audible. I shrugged, though I wasn't sure myself. I don't know, it's possible. Or something worse, I replied. The memory of the old woman's hollow eyes and the men's cruel demeanor was unsettling. Jamie's fingers drummed nervously on the steering wheel. What bothers me even more, Jamie continued, is that they saw us. They knew we were there, but they just left. It's like they didn't care. I shivered at his words. It was true. Their indifference felt chilling. They had made eye contact with us, acknowledged our presence, and then walked away. It was as if they were confident that we wouldn't do anything or that even if we did, it wouldn't make a difference. We drove on in silence, the weight of the night's events pressing heavily on us. The bright sunlight of the morning seemed almost mocking, a stark contrast to the fear we felt. We reached a small town and stopped at a diner to grab a quick breakfast. The normalcy of the place, with its cheerful staff and casual chatter, felt like a strange escape from the night's terror. As we ate, Jamie and I exchanged glances but spoke little. The waitress, with her warm smile and friendly demeanor, felt like a stark contrast to the harsh reality we'd faced. Once we finished, we decided to head to the next town to report what we had seen, though we were unsure if it would make a difference. The local police station was a small, unremarkable building. Inside, the officers seemed indifferent as we recounted the events. They took down our information and promised to look into it, but their lack of urgency left us feeling helpless. It seemed like our story was just another case in a long list of problems they faced daily. After leaving the police station, we continued our journey, but the mood was somber. The landscape passed by in a blur, each town and forest seeming less inviting than before. The sense of being watched, of something lurking in the shadows, lingered with us. As night fell, we found a different camping spot, one that felt safer though we were far from comfortable. We set up camp with a heightened sense of caution. Every sound seemed amplified, every rustle in the darkness a potential threat. We kept our lights off and spoke only in hushed tones. Lying in our hammocks, 
staring up at the stars. I couldn't shake the feeling of unease. I wondered about the old woman, if she had escaped or if she was still trapped in that dark world. I wondered if anyone else had witnessed what we saw or if they had been silenced before they could speak out. Jamie and I shared a silent understanding. We were more vigilant now, more cautious about our surroundings. The thrill of stealth camping had been tainted by the events of that night. We knew that while we sought to stay hidden, sometimes the true danger was being discovered by forces far more sinister than we could ever imagine. In the quiet moments, under the canopy of stars, the night's events replayed in my mind. I realized that even in the most serene settings, darkness could seep through, revealing the hidden horrors that lurked just beyond the shadows. Yesterday, I got this strong desire to go camping. However, by the time I gathered my gear and looked up a few possible spots, it was already late in the afternoon. Around 5.30, I felt a second wave of excitement and became determined to do something daring that I had thought about for a while. Like many others, I had heard of a trend called stealth camping. It doesn't involve the wilderness as much as other camping styles. Stealth camping allows you to camp unnoticed in urban areas, even if it's behind a store or between two gas stations. The key is to stay hidden. I grabbed my bike and headed for Green Park. My goal was to find two trees to set up for the night and leave no trace in the morning. I rode along a highway until I was close to a bridge and then veered off into the woods. I kept going along an old overgrown trail where thick bushes made it difficult to pass. I locked my bike to a small tree, making sure it was hidden, and marked my location on my GPS feeling good. I had made it this far without any problems. Planning trips like this often comes with a lot of anxiety for me, so I was relieved nothing had gone wrong yet. With my bag slung over my shoulder, I hiked about a quarter of a mile through dense bushes and loose slopes until the noise from the highway faded replaced by birds singing and the wind in the trees. It felt like I was far from civilization, but Green Park is open to the public with many visitors passing through, especially during certain times of the year. As I walked further, I noticed a deer trail and some tracks, but there were also footprints. They didn't seem fresh, maybe from before the last rain. I almost stumbled over a pile of old shoes and clothing, all green and black, falling apart. It was odd, but not entirely surprising considering the types of people that pass through the park. I wasn't looking for trouble, though, just solitude, so I moved on. I didn't want to risk running into someone I didn't want to meet. Finally, about half a mile from the road and away from any trails, I found two trees perfectly spaced with a beautiful view of the setting sun. I strung up my hammock but struggled with getting the angle right. The ropes kept slipping, and it took me a while to secure them properly. After what felt like forever, I zipped up my bug net and finally relaxed. For about 30 minutes, I heard the occasional snapping of twigs and odd animal sounds. I told myself it was just deer or sticks falling, trying to stay calm. Just as I was settling in, I heard a voice, why are you here? I jerked upright in my hammock, dropping my phone. A tall, bearded man with long hair stood about three feet away. He didn't seem threatening, but looked like he had been living out there for a long time. I sat there, unsure of how to respond. Uh, sorry, I didn't know anyone was nearby. I said, you're in my path. My camp's right up there. When are you leaving? He asked, pointing behind him. I'll be gone by dawn. I don't want any trouble. He introduced himself as Todd, and I tried to match his tone, hoping to keep things calm. Then he started ranting about something strange. How did you get past the barrier? The mountain is a sphere of cubic boron nitride. It's an impenetrable shield, he rambled on. At that point, I realized he wasn't thinking clearly. He continued, I don't have to believe anything you say. If you force me, I'll kill you. My heart raced, 
I was stuck in my hammock, completely vulnerable. I don't want any trouble, I repeated. I know my rights, he said. One of them is self-protection. Then, he walked off into the dark. I didn't relax for a second after he left. As soon as I felt it was safe, I packed up my things, checked my GPS for my bike, and started heading back down the slope. As I moved through the trees, I heard him shout behind me, Don't take anything. The mountain must stay whole for the shield. Before I could respond, something hit me on the head. I shined my flashlight and saw a jagged piece of metal. Another one struck me on the top of my head, making me see stars. I am the mountain, he screamed. In a panic, I sprinted towards my bike. I unlocked it, jumped on, and sped down the trail faster than I ever had before. He didn't chase me, but I could feel blood trickling down my scalp. An hour later, I was back home, bandaging my head and curled up with my cat. It was easily one of the worst camping experiences I've ever had, but I guess there's always some risk when trying something like that.